Hello, friends and neighbors. I was thinking to myself today, why not do a reaction to the most famous Colin David Eiffel and Colin Miller seminar on the internet? The nine plus hour seminar from 2012. And so here we are. Now, of course, I'm not going to go through the whole nine hours. I'll probably just go through the first few minutes and maybe uh, a couple other parts if I feel squarely. But this is this is the most famous one. It's the first one I ever watched from him. Uh, and I have seen the whole thing complete, not in this not this particular version of it, because there's many versions of it, but I have seen the the complete one, although I don't have it on file. And uh, I shouldn't have any problem with copyright strikes. So here we go. Let's see what uh, the man has to say. And by the way, Colin David Eiffel and Colin Miller passed away on the summer solstice of 2018. He is no longer with us on this plate. So keep that in mind. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Well, my, uh, as you know, my, my name is David Wynn Miller, but I punctuate my name. George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, Abraham Lincoln, uh, Benjamin Franklin, all punctuated the name, same as I did. They were all... He just said a list of names and said that they punctuate their name. I've not been able to find evidence of that. All 34 degree master masons. Now, I don't know if there's any masons in the crowd, but I am a 92nd degree mason. Uh, I know you've been taught that masonry goes to 33 and 34 degrees for grand masters. The reason I'm a 92nd degree mason is because in 1988 I broke the math interface in all 5,000 languages, proving that language is a linear equation in algebra. This hasn't been done in 8,500 years of written language. So, as uh, many people asked, was David Wimmiller a Mason? You just heard it from his own mouth, what he said. He also claimed that those other gentlemen's names that he mentioned, that they were 34 degree Masons, and he's saying that he's a 92nd degree Mason. When I did so, I was able to unlock the two-thirds of all the words missing from all languages in the world, and I can write any sentence in any language, frontwards and backwards, with the same meaning. Once this was discovered, it completely, uh, 48 hours after I published on the Internet, I had two secret services. Notice, friends and neighbors, that he said the word once this was discovered. Now, if you pay attention to what people say, the way they phrase things, he, it sounds like he said, once this was discovered, as in quantum grammar, once it was discovered, as in he discovered it. Now, I've never, to my knowledge, ever heard him say that he actually created this grammar technology. I've never actually heard him say that, that, you know, the same way that someone makes, I don't know, makes a cup or someone builds a table. I've never heard him say that he created it. But as he said here, he broke the mathematical interface and also he, you know, it was discovered. So keep that in mind agents from Washington at my front door going, do you realize what you've done? You've just disqualified every treaty, trust, and contract in 8,500 years on planet Earth. I says, well, uh, he says, who did you tell? I says, everyone. I says, I sent out uh, 100 videos, 20 hours long, including a 100-page report on the entire studies to all nations of the United Nations and over 100 TV and news agencies around the United States. By doing that, I protected myself because when you have a secret that is so profound that it would disqualify planet Earth, it would cause you to get shot. <laughs> and at every seminar, at, by the end of the seminar, there's always a dozen people that walk up and you say, why are you still walking around? Well, as Pandora, uh, uh, destroyer of worlds. 
Now, you might think that that's a bad thing. The word destroyer, D-E, means no, and stroy is contract. Of is an adverb which connects to a pronoun in front of it. P-R-O means no, N-O means no, and U-N means no. So the word destroyer is a no, no, no word. Of is an adverb, A-D-V. It's a modifier. Modifiers connect the pronouns in front of it and modify the verb after it. Modification is change, change is motion, motion is action, and action is verb. Therefore, the word world becomes a verb. Do you live in a world of verb or do you live in a world of a fact? As you all know, the, world is a, the word world is a fact. But because it's destroyer of verb, I destroyed the world of verb in all 5,000 languages worldwide. On okay, so a little bit ago, though, ago there, he said that uh, destroyer of worlds, he was saying that destroyer is a pronoun, a no, 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 of is an adverb, and in worlds is a verb. Um, it's a dangling participle verb. Well, the syntax is correct. The way he just explained it can be a little confusing to the beginner, to the novice, to the noob, where he said that the adverb connects the pronoun to blah, blah, blah. That, that's misleading. I can understand as a, you know, why he would say that in explaining it. Uh, however, to possibly head off any confusion. Um, adverbs don't connect anything. Adverbs are pure modification. And in the rules of syntax of correct sentence structure, communication, parsing, syntax, grammar, adverbs modify what comes after them, either verbs or adjectives. Modification runs one way port side, starboard side, left to right. When you read something, it runs one way, the motion. So that adverb has literally nothing to do with what comes in front of it, before it, what precedes it, what's to the left of it, what's to the port side of it. That has nothing to do with it, modification-wise. So if you have an adverb, um, Depending upon the scenario, a pronoun could be there in front of the adverb. Um, a verb could be in front of the adverb. But there would never be an adverb in front of an adverb. And there would never be an adjective in front of the adverb. So keep that in mind. I just want to clear that up. I'm definitely not saying what the guy, you know, who brought this to the public in 1988. I'm not saying... He's not correct in what he's saying here. I'm saying it's, it can be a little confusing the way that he's uh, presenting it. Much like he does the uh, for the bridge is over the water, for the water is under the bridge thing. He uses it as a teaching tool. But when you get down to brass tacks and you actually try to write that sentence forwards and backwards, it doesn't make any sense. April 6th, 1988. <clears throat> And so with that said, how did this come about? Well, in 1980, I went through a divorce. And in the divorce, Judge Stanley Miller said, you cannot uh, be a father to your children. And he took away my children. I'm going, well, why would you do that? I've been a good father for 10 years. And he goes, because I'm a judge, he says, and I can take away people's children just because I can. I says, well, that's sex discrimination under the 1964 Civil Rights Act for Equality. Uh, I says, I'm going to prosecute you. And he says, you can't prosecute judges. This is a big difference. I says, I know what the law is. You swore to support the Constitution of the United States and the laws written by the United States Congress, Senate, and Legislature. I says, that includes equality. I says, if I don't have equality, that's discrimination. Pretty simple. So I, I prosecuted Judge Stanley Miller in 1980, and he was disbarred as a judge. Six year, seven years later, Stanley Miller got reappointed again. So I just Googled uh, Judge Stanley Miller. And in an article from November 6, 2001, from uh, the Journal Times, uh, it was in Milwaukee, uh, it says that uh, Judge uh, Stanley Miller died at the age of 54. 
Um, talks about his history here, where he got his education. Um, in 1988, the Milwaukee Common Council appointed Miller to Municipal Court. He was appointed to Milwaukee County Circuit Court in 1992 and was elected unopposed in 1993. So, 88, 89, 91, 92. So, David Wynn Miller just said that he got this, this guy got disbarred and then eight years later was reappointed. So you see here it says in 1999, Miller was re-elected unopposed to circuit court. So that's basically from 1988 to 1999. That's not eight years, but it's close. But according to this, he was still an active judge that doesn't say anything about being disbarred so the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People are you kidding me is that a real thing I mean this is I digress this has nothing to do with this video or anything but that is insane because all people are color they have some color to them so what in the hell is going on here Anyways, back to the subject at hand. I don't. There is no evidence that he was disbarred. So one more little piece here: the 2001 Assembly Joint Resolution 76, uh, State of Wisconsin Legislature, relating to the life and public service of Judge Stanley A. Miller. Passed away November 4, 2001, in Milwaukee. Appointed Milwaukee County Circuit. In 92, retired in 2001. Trailblazer. Uh, okay. I will be the first to tell you that you are hard pressed to find any type of connection or wins for correct sentence structure in the fiction. Like, the fiction is not going to um, admit anything like that. Having said that, I would say that if he had been disbarred at some point, it would be on record. It would have to be on record. In the fiction, it would have to be. It literally would have to be. But it literally says here, this is another piece of evidence, as well as the, uh, the other one here from the Journal Times that I read. This is two, two is certification. I cross-referenced, they both say the same thing. That he was definitely active between 88 and 99. So that claim made by Colin David Eiffelman, Colin Miller, uh, we have David's word versus these two articles that say the same thing from different time periods so it's up to you dear viewer what you choose to participate with two weeks later after he was reappointed I showed up in his courtroom had him disbarred again four days later because <laughs> seven years later 1994 got reappointed again and uh, I uh, showed up in his courtroom two weeks after he got reappointed. Had him disbarred a third time. Three years later, he died in 1997. He just said that this guy died in 1997, this, this judge. Passed away November 4, 2001. What is going on here? And uh, never served much on the bench. Always was an administrator, but never a, a judge. In, uh, in, as, as a result of that, when the judge took away my children, that violation 
that breaking of my heart put me on a path. That path was anger. You don't take away a, a parent's child. And the, the pain that that caused, pain makes thought, thought makes wisdom, and wisdom grows to maturity. So as a result of that pain, I started studying. Now, we go through three phases in life. You do not know what you do not know. Well, it's like putting your hand in fire. It looks pretty until you touch it and you get burnt. Well, you know what you don't know about why you got burnt. Now, now I was aware of what I didn't know, so I had to study. And so because I studied, I learned about what, what the fire was. I learned about what the pain was. And from that, I then had knowledge. And when I had knowledge, I knew what I knew. And then I could become a teacher. In 1975, I became a college professor in Milwaukee. And I was uh, taught engineering and uh, metallurgy, heat treating, and blueprint reading. So I've been a teacher now 30, so 75, so going on 38 years. I hold a professional license for college. I also have three PhDs and 535 college credits, 17 full-time years of college. Kind of got stuck in college. I really liked it. Worked third shift nights as a tool and die welder, and I went to school full-time days. I had my and about to fill in my spare time because I didn't sleep. Um, I went ahead and had a second full-time job, and that was in real estate, teaching underwater welding. Uh, I had my own real estate company for 26 years besides doing law from 1980 to present time, 32 years. So this guy has a, has a, had a pretty packed schedule, okay? So again, friends and neighbors, none of this really has anything to do with grammar. He's telling you his life story, he's sharing his, uh, basically, personal, his uh, personal existence with you, what he filled his days with what credentials he's had. He's, he's building a credential base for himself, for whatever he's about to present in these nine or so hours here. But looking at this closely as, you know, just take picking one thing out of here, which was his comments and statements about uh, a judge named Stanley Miller, and then we find out a contradictory information about that on the internet from two different sources, just at a cursory glance and the dates even the date of, of the man's passing uh, they was incorrect on that so when you take things like that you take data like that that you can check on and see for yourself whether it's true or not true or correct or not correct and then you got to kind of weigh that against things that he's saying here about his own personal life story that he didn't sleep that he held a full-time job a part-time job and then went to school at the same time he's a uh, holds three phds was a professor um, underwater welding all these things okay are they true are they not true i i don't know i don't really uh i've never gone to any lengths to certify whether he taught at any college or anything like that Maybe you can, if you're interested in it. Maybe you can check it out and see what you can certify or not certify in the same way that I just did with his claims about Judge Stanley Miller. I have 80,000 hours of law experience. And uh, I've fielded, uh, I've done 2,500 seminars, including uh, over 1,000 TV and radio live. For He's done 2,500 seminars. Someone out there can do the math on that. Performances. I did the programs on 9-11 on national television on what really happened there. Uh, there's only a few people in the world that have my background and credentials about what heat treating is, nuclear science, string threes and quantum physics. I have a 200 IQ. I read 400 words a second in math codes. It's uh, something that's uh, acquired art. Uh, you can give me an inch of paper and I'll, of documents and I'll blow through it in about a minute. And I'll be able to tell you exactly about how many mistakes are in it and then what to do about it. The, uh, the program today is going to cover 
many different aspects. So I'm going to go through uh, the parts of speech, which I wrote up here. It took six years of my life to discover this. It isn't really what you think it is. And what they teach you in school is not what you actually, uh, is actually what's going on. And I'm, this isn't to insult anybody, but all of you have a second grade reading level. And it isn't just you, it's the entire population of the planet was instructed and, and through TV, radio, newspapers, and magazines to keep you in a second grade reading level because that way they could harvest the entire population of the planet. There is a few individuals called federal judges and uh, chief federal judges at a state level that control the what's called parse syntax grammar and the secrets therein. When I broke the code in 1988, I went to the United States Supreme Court and walked in there in 1989, and I says, I'm here to prosecute William Rehnquist, Chief Supreme Court Justice of the United States Supreme Court. Immediately, I was arrested for threatening the United States Supreme Court judge and taken into a closed room. Well, when we got down in that room, I had six marshals standing shoulder to shoulder surround me, and William Rehnquist came down from up in his chambers to see me, and I says, I have your signed confession for treason against the United States people. I says, I've, syntax, I've used parse syntax grammar against your opinion uh, since you've been in office. He says, okay, guys, you can all leave now. Mr. Miller and I are going to sit in this closed room. Uh, you've already frisked him. He has no weapons. He doesn't seem to be of stature that can, can overpower me. And we're going to have a little discussion. So for the next two and a half hours, William Rehnquist and I became very good friends. And uh, for the, that, until he died, and I removed him from office in June of 2005. We... June of 2005. Okay, so a couple things here. David just said that he and just Judge Rehnquist became very good friends. Now, I have to think, I mean, to the best of my knowledge, and... Um, someone can correct me if I'm wrong. If you're a judge, you're wearing that black robe, that black dress. You're a, you're a Freemason. You're a Master Mason. Um, so, obviously, Colin David I. Wayne Colin Miller is a Master Mason. Master Mason just means you're third level or above. Uh, third degree, sorry, or above. So, I can see why they would be friends, because they're both Masons. However, what he just said there, he just made a claim. Um, let's see if it stands up here. After 33 years of service to the Supreme Court, Reinquist fell ill in 2005. He refused to retire even after his diagnosis of thyroid cancer and remained Chief Justice until his death on September 3rd, 2005. We were pretty good friends. I taught him syntax, the math interface on grammar, and he taught me all the secrets of the procedures of judges. But a lot of the things he taught me, he was in error of because two-thirds of all the words were missing from the procedures by which he wanted to formulate answers. What do you mean by that? That, that sounds kind of mysterious, maybe. But what he means by that is that when he says two-thirds of all the words were missing, he means the positionals and lodials were missing, therefore there were no facts. So in a sentence like, uh, let's see, what could I say? The dog barks, or, or I saw the dog bark. You know, you I saw the dog bark, that's five words, okay? The way you would say that in correct sentence structure could be like, for this claim is knowledge of the facts, as with this claim of the witness with the sight of the dog with the performance of the dog's hyphen bark with the sensation by this claimant and by this witness period. So you can see how many words I added. Two thirds of the words were missing. Do you see what I'm saying? You added the word. I added words to it so that I could speak in correct sentence structure and position the facts 
with correctness. So that, that's what he means by that. Two-thirds of the words are missing. The positionals and lodials are missing. Now, believe it or not, we are all actors in a play that have been already written. All of you believe that you have a certain amount of, of choice to make in life. But the fact is, uh, and I will do this later this afternoon when we get into some history programs, that we are on timetables, timetables that run on seven-year international, uh, on domestic bankruptcies and 70-year international bankruptcies. These bankruptcies control the planet for the last 6,500 years in all countries. All countries worldwide are controlled by the post office, not the courts, not the judges, not the kings and queens, but the postmasters of the world run the entire planet and have for 6,700 years. Going all the way back to Pharaoh, henceforth the Masons. Now, a lot of you uh, were in this room today. A room is a closed area, so therefore it's a court. I'm going to show you a dollar bill here, which you're all familiar with. And on the back of the dollar bill, you have the eagle, right? Notice the eagle's wings are turned up. If you notice the eagle's wings here are turned down, that's because it's a phoenix. This is Vatican rule, banking. And the flag here has yellow fringe on it. And the yellow fringe flag has a changes the dimension of the flag. This is a maritime braid for commerce. The fringe changes the description of the flag. It's under Army Regulations 840-10, Chapter 2-6. It's been modified, Allows just like grammar. fringe to be put on military flags for parades. But anything you put on top of the flag cancels the contract of what a flag is. Just like the spear or the spire that Russell J. Gould has been putting on top of his flag for the last couple of years. So even though you think you're looking at a United States flag... <laughs> United, UN means no, and ITE is citizen. A no citizen's condition of state flag. So unite from Proto-Indo-European, OI, one unique. So he said, I IT means citizen. I don't see it. Do you see it? Let's try something else. Hmm. One more thing. Okay, friends and neighbors, I have no idea where he's getting that IT means citizen because I certainly can't find it. Can you? I think I'll, I'll choose this spot to end it here. I've chosen to challenge just a couple of small things of what he's saying, a couple of claims that he made about the, the two judges, and then about, you know, getting into a little bit of the grammar, his claim that IT means citizen. All of those claims that I just challenged, I show a continuance of the evidence that there's a contradiction there. There's contradictory data out there that contradicts what he's saying. Now, the, my volition going into this video wasn't to do that, it, honestly. It, it was not to uh, cast him in a negative light at all. Not at all. I wasn't expecting that to happen. Actually, I'm just looking at this with fresh eyes. I haven't watched this seminar in years. And just in the first few minutes, I picked a couple, you know, a handful of things out to try and see if I could certify what he's saying, back it up, or maybe show that what he's saying just, you know, might actually be not true. And so you, you 
I shared with you what I found and the way I found it. Very easy, very simple, with just little searches. And I found, you know, some things, some contradictions in here. So, you be the judge, friends and neighbors, about the man and about his knowledge. And then you can apply that to the other claims he makes and also about his the grammar that he taught and the way that he taught it and what he taught it, you know. Because what I can say now in the light of what he's saying, that what he taught in the grammar and what I taught, the way that we teach are complete. It's completely different. Everything that I teach on this channel, I can certify to you. And I do that in over 600 videos. I, I approach things from different angles. I cross-reference. I show you. I go through great lengths, painstaking detail, to show you how you can certify what I'm saying with regards to the grammar. Of course, I don't tell big stories or anything like that. That's not my thing. Uh, my thing is to teach grammar. And uh, I can certify everything I say about the grammar. I'm very careful about what I say about the grammar because of that. So, that's sort of the, the long and short of this uh, reaction video is, you be the judge. When you hear someone saying something, you hear someone talking, making claims, do a little legwork, look it up, and then decide for yourself whether or not you choose to participate <laughs> with the spiel that they're laying down. Thanks for joining me. If you'd like to learn correct sentence structure, communication, parse, syntax, grammar, contact me at the email address listed at the bottom of your screen. I will set up a 10 to 15 minute video consultation between you and me. You can ask me whatever you like, and I'll do the same, and we'll see if this is something that uh, you're prepared to commit to. If you'd like to support the channel, click on the Join button underneath this video. There are two tiers of membership. Uh, the second tier has access to exclusive content not available to the public. Once again, thank you for watching. Uh, hit the subscribe button. Hit the like button. Turn the notification bell to all so that you don't miss any of my premieres because I do post on a very consistent basis. There are over 500 correct sentence structure videos for here you to study on this channel. My gift to you, my fellow mankind. Thank you again, and I'll see you in the next one.